Um, our next speaker today is Ellen Eaton, who's you've already heard a little bit from her. I don't know why she's leaving, don't go anywhere, as an associate professor at UAB. And as you've already heard, her research and patient care are really centered around infectious disease um, uh, complications of substance use and, and mental health uh, challenges. Um, and she's speaking today about the role of HIV providers uh, to help end the opioid epidemic. So thank you so much, Dr. Eaton. Thank you, thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me, and um, before I get going, I just wanted to tell you all a little bit about myself. Um, I am an infectious disease physician. I am not addiction medicine board certified, and I say that to really empower you all to take on addiction treatment as part of your routine care as well. Um, I really started the opioid treatment clinic at 1917, just seeing a missed opportunity. We had patients with opioid use that we were referring all over town, they would have a four to six week wait list to get on treatment. Methadone clinics are really hard to access in Alabama. We didn't have a lot of buprenorphine providers. So that was 2019 and here I am now, four years in with about a 60 patient panel. And um, it's really just been a pleasure to see how well patients do when they have comprehensive integrated HIV and addiction treatment. So just for a little context and really to empower you all to take on this patient population as well. Let's see. I may be having. Thank you. Okay, great. And my financial disclosure is here. All right. For learning objectives, I hope that when you walk away from this session, you'll be able to understand the key policy changes around opioid use disorder that affect your patient populations understand some of the evidence-based treatment options, and really feel, if not comfortable, more comfortable considering opioid use disorder treatment as part of your practice. All right, so why are we here? I am not gonna share a lot of data on overdoses, but I just wanted to remind us why we're here today. Um, for those that wanna learn more about the evidence and clinical trials around opioid and addiction treatment in patients with HIV, I'll put a plug for the IAS um, DEA training that is available online where several of our esteemed colleagues in HIV and addiction go through with me an eight hour curriculum on this. So there's lots of data for you there. It's, a, it's on demand um, through the website IAS USA. Um, I'm not gonna go through a lot of that data today. I really wanna use this to have a call to action for our HIV clinician colleagues. But I do wanna remind you all why we're here. We are seeing annual mortality rates that exceed the AIDS crisis at the height of the AIDS epidemic due to overdose. Um, like our patients with HIV, this is not a population that is um, easy to care for. I think there's a ton of stigma. There's a ton of policy barriers. There are innumerable social determinants of health. Things have not gotten any better, truly, since we saw the early opioid um, crisis in the early 2000s. We know that more than 111,000 people died of a drug overdose, overdose in the last 12 months, and we know that's an underestimation, right? A lot of our patients are unhoused, they're marginalized, there's no death investigation, there's no toxicology, so we know this is an underestimation. And then for those of us who come from orange and red states, um, red, you know, not the type of red you're thinking about, red that you see here in this map. Um, although there is, the Venn diagram does overlap a lot. You can see that some of our states, Oregon, you can see Alabama, you can see some states up and down the Northeast Coast have had an increase in overdose deaths in the last year. Although the percent change nationally is a 1.4% decrease Alabama has had an 11% increase in the last year, and a lot of the other states as well, um, Texas, um, that you see here. So I think we were hopeful that there was a flattening of overdose deaths after the public health emergency from SARS-CoV-2, but what we're seeing is really that the data has not improved like it should. Oops, I think I skipped twice. No, I didn't. Okay, so now we're gonna do a question what percentage of patients with opioid use disorder do you think get treatment? 
great. So um, people are paying attention here. Um, yes, we see a significant minority that is being treated. Um, as you can see, only about one in five with opioid use disorder, 15 to 20 percent, um, depending on the data you look at, um, are getting treatment for opioid use disorder. I think um, of my patient population, um, prior to us opening the clinic, the vast majority did not have another clinic, so they weren't transferring into us. They were new to care because we provided a new clinic that was integrated opioid treatment within an HIV clinic. And you may ask yourself, why is this? Um, and it's all the things that have been barriers to HIV care traditionally. Um, it is transportation, it is co-pays, it is child care, it is leaving work um, multiple times a month or every month to get um, urine drug screens, for example. Um, it's not easy to access care um, for addiction treatment or opioid use disorder treatment specifically in Alabama. Um, so. The reason I showed this figure is to really encourage you to think how you can be a part of the solution. Um, it starts with screening, so some of you are going to be really overwhelmed by this. Your clinic has limited resources, you're short on nurses, you're short on physicians, but if you can just start by routinely screening and linking people to care, knowing what resources are in your community, um, building inroads with your health department, with your addiction colleagues, your psychiatry colleagues, um, and being able to provide your patients with a referral. Um, and then ideally, hopefully in a few years, you'll come back to me at this conference and tell me that you started um, buprenorphine, um, if not sooner than a few years, a buprenorphine clinic within your clinic is, is truly the goal. So now I'm going to give you some hopeful data around policy changes that I think will have positive, um, for the most part, positive implications on your patient populations. Um, so the X waiver is gone. The X waiver was additional certification for DEA um, certified clinicians. And upon completion of eight hours for physicians of additional training, you could get an X waiver. Um, I see Dr. Thornton in the audience. I took this training <laughs> um, with her in 2019. Um, it is no longer required. Why? Because we realized it was a barrier to treatment. Um, so now, for anyone who has a DEA, um, uh, who has an active DEA or is going through the renewal process, you will need to complete a, eight hours of training on opioid and substance use disorder. This is part of the MATE Act, M-A-T-E, which went into effect in June of 2023. Um, so this is good news, and as I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of content on the IAS USA and other websites that you can get certified. Um, I will say, even though this policy went into effect in June, I've seen very few clinicians who were not previously wavered take on buprenorphine prescribing. Um, so we still have work to do. There's lots of layers around training and stigma and education and frankly freeing up time and compensating providers to do this work as well. Okay, next question. Which professional societies recommend their members treat opioid use disorder? The AMA, the American Association of Addiction Psychiatry, the American Association of Addiction Medicine, all of the above. Great, and so you all have seen it. You all answered. If you are a member of any of these professional societies, you can't say you didn't know that the recommendation was for you um, to treat opioid use disorder. And the overall theme of this talk, I wanted to make the questions easy. I want to make sure that I normalize treatment. I don't want to overwhelm you with challenging data, intimidate you around buprenorphine. I want you to realize this is something we should all be doing. You can do it. Um, ID doctors can do this um, as part of their practice. And family medicine doctors, pediatricians, you name it, primary care providers, we can do this. All right, um, so going back to the MATE Act, um, it is supposed to empower us all to prescribe buprenorphine. As I mentioned, it's, um, it is a one-time requirement. Um, and just some specifics um, around um, how to satisfy the requirement. Um, 
from my colleagues who have gone up for a DEA renewal since the MADE Act went into effect. Um, I'm included, I had to renew. Um, my understanding, it's kind of an on your honor. You should be able to, if audited, provide those eight hours of training. Um, it's likely that you have attended something as part of Grand Rounds or maybe a talk at your university or institution. Maybe you attended this talk right here and you're gonna jot that down. Maybe you partic participated in some other IS trainings around addiction treatment. So it is kind of on your honor, but do document that if you are hoping to maintain DEA um, certification and want to take on buprenorphine or addiction treatment more broadly. Sorry about that, the animation. All right, and then just as a reminder, I was really surprised to see this. The American Academy of um, the Dental Association, OMSF, um, in addition to the addiction medicine psychiatry, so really a broad call, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, um, really just a reminder here that we all can be a part of of the solution to treating the, the opioid crisis. Um, and I mentioned earlier, there is an IAS USA um, MATE compliant, compliant webinar training. Um, the PCSS is another website that has um, great content, New England Journal. These are all online options that are free to help you maintain that certification with great content. And then I've included um, Dr. Uh, Jutanjali Chander's talk, which was just last week on substance use alcohol and tobacco use disorder on demand. So there's content around opioid use disorder and addiction more broadly that can help you meet that eight hour training requirement. So a really important policy change and I hope that we'll all take that back to our clinics and use it to expand access to treatment. The next is telemedicine and this is something that is very near and dear to my heart because as I mentioned, I started a clinic in 2019, in November. What happened after November of 2019? We rapidly um, pivoted to telehealth for our opioid treatment clinic. And we have published and others have published, telehealth was very effective in maintaining, um, retaining and linking new patients to both HIV and addiction treatment. And it wasn't just fancy audio visual portals, it was telephone only, audio only. Um, telemedicine. This has been a lifeline for my patients, especially my patients who are rural, although I'm located in Birmingham, a lot of my patients drive 30 or more minutes to my clinic. And I'll tell you the most helpful use of telehealth has been patients who are transitioning from inpatient um, rehab, criminal legal settings, um, they're moving, um, they are unhoused. Those are the people who cannot physically come to my clinic to participate in some of the required surveillance, um, for example, urine drug screens, when I was able to minimize requirements of my patient and just call them, check in, screen them, check in on their mental health, check in on their adherence to their buprenorphine, their ART, um, I, I really was able to retain the most vulnerable group. As you know, a lot of that is being scaled back. A lot of us are working at a state and local and a federal level to advocate for continued telemedicine, especially for people who are on buprenorphine. If you are, thank you. And I, I just want you to know there are patients now in my clinic who I am not as a, able to successfully retain because of some of the state requirements of me now. Um, so anything we can do to continue to provide that lifeline is going to link this very vulnerable group and keep them engaged in care. Um, at a federal level, the DEA has extended telemedicine flexibilities through 2024. As I mentioned, my state level is much more restrictive and I'm sure there are other um, state policies for, for you all who are a very um, diverse audience. So check in with your um, policymakers, speak up on behalf of this patient population. There are patients, as I mentioned, in 2023 who I cannot provide the same care and who I have lost um, because I cannot provide services without them physically coming in. And they are a very sick group with active viremia who we very much want to retain in care, not just at a patient level, but a public health level. And I should also mention, as we talked about hep C in the last hour, this is a great way to retain and link patients with HIV and hep C to curative ther therapy. So think about that population as well when you're thinking about telemedicine. Um, another policy update, over-the-counter naloxone nasal spray, um, 
This is a big deal for some states as well who had restrictions on naloxone. Alabama specifically, I could not um, distribute naloxone without a physician or a nurse practitioner or PA in the state of Alabama until this policy went into effect. So this was tremendous for my state, and I'm sure there are others who until naloxone went over the counter, it was really restrictive in terms of scaling up at resource fairs and pop-ups in um, homeless encampments, for example. Um, so this is good news. We now have expanded our access to naloxone, um, and I would encourage you um, to make sure that you, as a provider of a high-risk group, also carry naloxone. Um, I, I have my backpack across um, the stage, and I was reminded I have two in my backpack because I flew. And if you treated anyone who uses fentanyl in the current era, you know that sometimes one naloxone is no longer sufficient to reverse an overdose. So I would encourage you to have at least one, if not two, naloxones with you in your bag at work, um, because we do have a very high-risk population. And I'll, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that a lot of our youth who are not high risk for overdose are actually overdosing in the current opioid crisis. Um, so if you have teens, if you work in a community, I think it's also really important for you to have naloxone for that reason, if you do, even if you don't have patient care responsibilities. Um, I have a picture of the hospital here to remind me to share an anecdote that Mike Sag reminded me to talk about, which is right along this street at UAB, we had, um, an episode where a fellow, an ID fellow, was walking back from rounds on a Tuesday afternoon and saw a patient who was slumped over in their locked vehicle, which was parallel parked um, outside of our ID fellow office. And although there were numerous bystanders who could, you know, bang on the door and finally open the door, none of them had naloxone, and that patient expired. Now, that was on a medical campus with lots of foot traffic, physicians, nurses, um, there were plenty of trained physicians that were huddled around that individual, but none of them had naloxone, and by, by the time emergency responders were able to get there, the patient had expired. So just a reminder, this happens in and around us, and this policy change is very helpful, and I'm hoping we'll all act on it by arming ourselves with naloxone. Okay. This is not necessarily a policy change, but as an emerging drug trend, I wanna make sure our colleagues are aware of. Um, xylazine, which has been called trank dope, trank zombie drug, is an, it, it's emerged, I shouldn't say emerging, it is now emerged as a leading adulterant of our um, stimulant and opioid supply. Um, it has been in urban areas for several years. It is now widespread throughout Alabama it is widespread throughout the US. The reason that we as HIV providers should be aware is that this, um, this chemical causes a lot of morbidity and overdose, has overdose potential that we frankly don't know how to treat. We, we don't know how to treat the necrotic wounds that are resulting in these patients. Um, we don't fully understand how to reverse overdose that is associated with xylazine. Uh, my fellow recently ran a report of overdoses that were examined by our forensic pathologist at UAB starting in 2019, and almost 100% had xylazine associated with a stimulant or an opioid. Um, and so, you know, this, this drug is driving overdoses. We don't, we, there's a lot that we don't know about this chemical compound but I think you should be aware of it. And in terms of harm reduction, many of you may be in states where xylazine test strips are available. Unfortunately, in my state, they are not legal, but my understanding is that in most states, xylazine test strips are available. So if you have patients who use drugs, please you know, inquire about your state policy, talk to your health department, talk to other addiction and harm reduction providers. These are test strips very similar to um, a, a urine drug strip you can see in some of the testing um, or a fentanyl test strip if you if you use those or have seen those for your patients who use drugs but it's something the patient can use to test their drug supply and if it is po you know positive for xylazine harm reduction would be that the patient chooses not to use that substance 
and gets another substance from their dealer or wherever they get their substances. Um, but just something to bring up and for you to be aware of. I did, this is after lunch, but I thought it was important for you to know what the wounds look like. These are from UAB Forensic Pathology. So these are the type of necrotic wounds that cause a, a fair amount of morbidity in patients um, who do inadvertently get access to xylazine. I should say this is traditionally a veterinary sedative. I had that on the last slide and forgot to mention that. So it poses a policy challenge because it does need to be accessible to veterans who use it to sedate elephants before they go to the MRI, for example. But we don't want it to be available and, and um, contaminating the drug supply for, for our patients who then will have these horrible necrotic wounds that do lead to limb loss. Um, and obviously a lot of morbidity. Okay, so evidence-based treatment options. Um, which of the following is true for buprenorphine for opioid use disorder? Okay, great. Looks like everybody's ready to start prescribing buprenorphine, huh? I'm, I'm loving these responses. Okay, great. So it is um, an effective treatment option. It is well tolerated. There are few, few side effects. I have had very few patients who cannot tolerate it. And there are very few drug interactions, and we'll talk more about that. So thinking about FDA-approved medications for the treatment of opioid use disorder, we have methadone, buprenorphine, and extended release naltrexone. Methadone, most of us will not be prescribing. It's required that you be working in a methadone treatment clinic and have a certain type of pharmacy um, that can dispense them. Um, you should know that it is associated with improved HIV adherence for patients who take it, it reduces overdose, reduces mortality, can allow patients to stay engaged in HIV and hep C treatment if we treat their underlying opioid use disorder with methadone. Buprenorphine being the second option here is a partial mu agonist and partial kappa agonist. It is available sublingual as a film or tablet, an implant or injection. Um, the injectables can be monthly, there is a six-month implant. And the thing you should know about buprenorphine is that it is safe to prescribe in primary care clinics, in HIV clinics. This is my, the drug that I provide in my clinic. It is safer than methadone, has very little overdose potential, few interactions with ARTs, and again, improves viral load suppression, reduces HIV risk behaviors, reduces overdose. It is truly harm reduction as well. And then lastly, extended release naltrexone is a full antagonist, is used as an injectable form. It can be used in primary care settings. You all may use it in your clinics. Can also be used to treat alcohol use disorder. So great for patients with who use both opioids and have alcohol use disorder. Um, does have the adherence advantage, but for patients who fall out of care, they are opioid naive. Remember, this is an antagonist. So that is a population. This is this is why it is not used as often as buprenorphine. If they fall out of care and no longer have that antagonist on board, they will be opioid naive and are very high risk for overdose. It does reduce HIV risk behaviors, though, and reduces overdose for those who can remain re engaged in care. Um, I've said this several times throughout the talk, um, but there are few drug-drug interactions between OUD treatment medications um, and recommended initial ART regimens. There is a potential interaction between buprenorphine and some of the older ART regimens. You can see a potential weak interaction um, between methadone and abacavir, but one thing I want you to leave here with is knowing that you can and should be referring your patients who are on ARTs to medications for opioid use disorder. Buprenorphine will be the most accessible, and there are very few medical reasons that you should not, very few drug-drug interactions. And then for hepatitis C, which we know is very common in this patient population, um, there are no drug-drug interactions between medications for OUD treatment and recommended hep C regimens. Um, for those who want additional resources, you're thinking about prescribing buprenorphine, um, this is a kind of step-by-step -step guide for the ID clinician, for the clinician who is not addiction medicine trained like myself, highly recommend it. 
Um, and lastly, we're just going to go briefly through how to treat opioid use disorder. And we're going to focus on buprenorphine, which is the most accessible for our patients. Hopefully, most of you are screening for substance use in your clinics. If not, there are several validated tools. What I've given here is the NIDA quick, quick Screen, which is a two-item questionnaire. If they are negative for these first two questions about prescription drug use for non-medical reasons or illicit drugs, if they report no, you're done. If they report yes, you're going to get more granular questions. And here's an example of how you could start with the Quick Screen, and then if they were positive, there are other examples, for example, the rods that can walk you through, through additional questions. What type of opioids? What are you injecting them? You know, how are you taking them? Um, and then you can assess and initiate meds for opioid use disorder. And you can and should do this as part of your routine practice. Um, this is a clinical opioid withdrawal scale, um, which for those who are familiar with the CEWA scale, it's kind of similar for alcohol use disorder. Um, at the bottom right, you can see that if they have a total score of 5 to 12, that's considered mild withdrawal. A score of 13 to 24 is moderate, and 25 to 36 is moderately severe. Greater than 36 is severe. I will say I used to really follow this when I first started. I was very nervous about precipitated withdrawal. Because if you start a person on buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist, while they have fentanyl or heroin in their system, the buprenorphine will kick that substance off their opioid receptors and put them into precipitated withdrawal. I was terrified of that. I followed this to a T. And then I realized patients know their moderate opioid withdrawal. I would talk to, when do you feel ter that terrible feeling where you really know you have to use or you just feel like you're going to die? You've got goose flesh, you're tearing, you're nauseated, you're anxious. That's when you start your buprenorphine. That's when your opioid receptors are ready for that partial opioid agonist. Um, so a lot of our patients know their, themselves very well and can help us through this process. But just know when you're initiating buprenorphine or any opioid agonist like methadone, if your patient has, you basically, for the buprenorphine, you want to make sure they are in mild to moderate withdrawal to prevent that precipitated withdrawal. Um, this is a diagram that we used to use, and I say used to use because when we published this in 2020, we were not seeing as much fentanyl as we are now. It's a very evolving treatment climate for patients with opioid use disorder. We used to say, start with you know, two to four milligrams of buprenorphine, and if you do okay, you can repeat it at the end of the day. Now we're seeing patients are exposed to such high doses of opioids that we are recommending they start buprenorphine eight or even 16 milligrams, and it, generally the tabs or films come in in eight milligrams co-formulated with the naltrexin. Um, we're recommending that they start 16 milligrams in that first day, and some patients need to start 24. Um, again, I'm going to provide you with a lot of resources. I don't want to overwhelm you. You can do this. Um, but I just want you to know it's OK to start higher doses in your patients because the fentanyl crisis has led them to have such high opioid dependence that they are going to need higher doses to be comfortable. This is, a, this is another buprenorphine induction method that has become much more common in the fentanyl area. It's called microdosing. And I've seen literature in the hospital setting as well as in the outpatient setting. And basically what this is saying is that because patients are requiring such high doses uh, or they're getting such high doses of fentanyl, many of them cannot wait till they hit moderate to, mild to, or moderate to severe withdrawal even before they go use fentanyl again. If you send them home with buprenorphine 8 and you tell them start 8 in the morning, take another 8 in the afternoon, they have used because they were so uncomfortable. So what we've done with this microdosing is we're slowly replacing their heroin or fentanyl and their opioid receptors with buprenorphine. And you will have access to this slides, but I literally will write this out for my patients. And I will say, on day one, you're going to take this. I never encourage you to continue to take fentanyl. However, if you are so uncomfortable that you need to continue using opioids, that is OK. And what I'm doing with this microdose, I'm going to slowly replace that dangerous, highly fatal opioid with a safe opioid. And here's how you're going to do it. And I write this out for my patients. Um, so I'm leaving you with a lot of additional resources. I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. I want you all to reach out to me if you have questions, if you're interested, if you need some peer mentoring on how to start buprenorphine. I've been there. Um, this is a, a HRSA resource for you, the targethiv.org best practices. 
Um, and then I have four additional readings here that I think will really help understand how to integrate addiction treatment into your, into your practice, starting with the ISUSA um, HIV treatment guidelines, a really nice paper on stigmatizing language and how we can be more inclusive with our language, a paper on how adolescents and young adults are really an undertreated group that is disproportionately affected by opioids. Um, and then finally, a paper where I talk about rapid start. We all know rapid start for ART treatment, and we need to be doing rapid start for opioid use disorder treatment because we know it is acutely fatal. Um, so thank you all for listening. I think we made it through. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. Before we get started with the questions, um, they've asked me to have everyone in the audience who's still having problems with their internet just to raise their hand so they can get a sense of how bad it is. Okay, it's, it's uh, diffuse. Thank you for that. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. I'm Lawrence Golden from Mendocino County, California. I'd like to share a little bit of my experience with buprenorphine. I've been an HIV provider for 30 years, and about 15 years ago when I moved to rural Mendocino County, I was asked to get involved with buprenorphine, which I've now been doing for almost 10 years. And I just want to share this with you. I really enjoy it. And the reason I enjoy it is the same reason I enjoy doing HIV care. I'm trained as an internist. And what I do all day long is often very frustrating. I feel like I'm tweaking people's drugs. I'm treating their, their asthma, their COPD, their diabetes, and you know, Maybe in the long run, I will change the quality of their life a little. I might add a year or two to their life, which is sort of interesting, and, but also frustrating. Whereas what I love about HIV is I know very quickly I make a huge difference in people's mm -hmm. lives. It changes their lives. I've seen it. I've been doing this since near the beginning. And I get the same hit from doing buprenorphine <laughs> care that I get from yeah. HIV. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Be yeah, yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> the change is quick. You see it. I've seen people's lives change so quickly. I've had people who are practically living on the street get back with their families, get back to work. Not everybody, of course, is a great success story, but it is so immediate compared to what I do in internal medicine but I now love doing buprenorphine care, and it really isn't that difficult. Thank you so much. And I did not pay him or plant him there, but what a perfect encouragement for us all. I'm gonna give a quick anecdote that I meant to start with, and I think I was a little um, just forgot between the panel and this, but I had a new patient three weeks ago, we'll call him Jay, 30 years old, um, raised himself, um, parents both used substances, um, he first experimented with methadone at age 10, methadone at age 10, because it was around his house. He was injecting by 17. He was incarcerated in his 20s. He was diagnosed with hep C in his early 20s. He should have gotten PrEP. He should have gotten BUP. He should have gotten all the things. But when he was released from jail three weeks ago, he was screened for HIV. He was newly diagnosed, came to our clinic, and one-stop shop, right? He came to our clinic. He was um, you know, linked to HIV care, started on ART, started on a BUP, and he, he was crying for my peer, and my peer was crying with him. He said, you know, I don't have any family, but now I feel like today I have a family. And, you know, what a story, you know? And that's the kind of patient that, you know, really um, carries us through these, you know, often challenging patient interactions. So I just wanted to share that. Um, who's next? So let's start with Fran, and then we'll go from right to left. Uh, hi, I'm Fran Cornos, a psychiatrist from New York City and a speaker tomorrow. I want to begin by saying I loved your talk because it's about advocacy, and that's really what we need. It's about expanding roles. I did want to say, because I've gone to a lot of talks about xylazine, I think one of the reasons why it's become popular is that it doesn't kill people as readily as fentanyl. So that's, I just mentioned that, that fentanyl is less in use and xylazine's more in use because people on xylazine are less likely to die and mm. drug users want people alive rather than, I mean drug mm. dealers. They want people alive instead of dead. So there's actually a, a reason that underlies that trend. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating and, and 
so many people ask me, why are the dealers putting fentanyl in Xanax? Why are the dealers putting fentanyl in marijuana and heroin if it's killing their clients? And I am not a drug policy you know, expert. Um, so I think these motivations are, are fascinating and certainly have tremendous implications for our patients. Um, yeah. oh. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I just wanted to mention in our email at work today, we got an, um, a notification of a publication coming out of Prevention Point in Philadelphia on xylazine-associated wounds, and it just came out a week ago in the Journal of Addiction Medicine um, by McFadden et al., and it just, it has an amazing nurse-oriented um, guidance on uh, care of xylazine wounds, which we see a lot in Boston as well. And I would say um, xylazine, fentanyl, um, benzodope in Canada, I think it's really important to mention that the, the drug supply is just really hyper-regional, and it's rapidly evolving, and so every time we think we have a handle on what's going on, it will shift. Um, in part because it's illegal and anyway, uh, <laughs> but just it's, I think it's important to realize that we need to know and be aware and be talking about things like testing, but also listening to our patients and seeing what's happening and being able to be flexible um, and respond. Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing that. And Rachel um, has been an advocate for us, McFadden, who published that. Um, it, I think the regionality aspect is really important. We reached out to her last week. Um, she is an emergency medicine nurse with an MPH background, but she's been dealing with xylazine wounds for 10 years, whereas in Alabama, we're just now seeing them. So a great way to connect and learn from our colleagues, much like we're learning from our colleagues who have treated heroin in the Northeast for decades, whereas we're just, you know, we're relatively new to our epidemic in Alabama. So great point, and thank you. Maybe we can circulate that, um, that resource. Um, yeah. I'm a nurse practitioner on a mobile unit in New York, so I do a lot of BUP, and I really love BUP treatment. Um, I'm wondering what your experience has been with macro dosing. Um, I do micro dosing um, for some patients who I feel like have been really unstable. I have done macro dosing, especially with fentanyl, um, and I have had some success, but I think as a community, it seems scary, obviously, to prescribe more than the 24, but there is some data now that the 32 can sometimes be helpful, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yes, thank you so much. And for our colleagues who aren't as familiar, so, um, and I kind of glossed over this, but in general, um, the buprenorphine um, that we use is often we feel comfortable starting with eight, maybe going up to 16 for that first day, maybe going up to 24 on the second day for a total daily dose. Um, but it has been recommended that you not really exceed that until the fentanyl crisis where we're seeing people that are just needing a lot more. Um, I refer folks to my addiction colleagues um, when they are not comfortable on 24 milligrams of buprenorphine, but it's really important to think outside the box just because it's not recommended to exceed 24. And the reason I say that is that if some people still have low-grade withdrawal symptoms and cravings at 24 milligrams, they're not going to come back to you. I mean, withdrawal feels like you have the flu. And if your doc is saying, this is the most I can do, here's your 24 day, you know, see in a month, you're not gonna come back to care. You're gonna fall out of treatment altogether, likely, and return to what made you feel better, which is non-medical opioids, right? So I think it is really important if your patients are um, so opioid dependent that they need more than 24 milligrams. If you don't feel comfortable doing the 32, which at this point I am not, but I do reach out to my board certified addiction medicine colleagues and there's been a few patients that they'll see assess and if they decide to start on a higher dosis, I will then bring them back to my clinic and follow them. And then the microdosing, I will say, I felt more comfortable with because so many of my patients have had precipitated withdrawal and just feel more comfortable st starting with that lower dose and continuing to use non-medical opioids while they're slowly replacing their fentanyl with the buprenorphine. Um, and that's just been a more patient-centered approach for my patients in my experience. Um, yeah. Rachel, we'll over here, and then we'll go to that side. Hi, thank you for this talk. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner in Tennessee, and I do HIV care and primary care. And I wanted to ask advice. Um, I'm not allowed to prescribe buprenorphine because I'm not in an OBOT. And is there any movement of that in states where we can't do that because we're not physicians, even though we're treating the patients that really need it? Yeah, so I wonder if that is a state level. It is, okay. And this is why policy is, you know, you have to know your state policy. In my state, nurse practitioners who, and PAs who have a DEA um, can do some additional training and prescribe buprenorphine. Um, 
other than you know, you know, writing to your policymakers, um, I would talk to your clinician, your MD colleagues, because you could play a tremendous role alongside them. And I will say, in our OBOT clinic, my RN does so much for me. I'm missing clinic today. Who's helping make sure that people aren't without, you know, Monday's my clinic day. Who's making, you know, doing bridges, um, putting in prescriptions under my name that I can then co-sign. She's making sure people have their naloxone. She's following up on hep C labs. So even independent of being able to prescribe the buprenorphine, you could make a tremendous impact in terms of that integrated, comprehensive HIV and addiction care. So maybe that's one place you want to start. Um, but I do think that we're going to have to um, expand our state policies if we're going to make a dent in those numbers I shared with you, which are abysmal. Ellen, yeah. she should also talk to your state. Um, is it MP or PA? I'm sorry, I forget which. MP. Your MP organization, That's because I know, I don't know, Brent, you can maybe talk, but anyway, we had some things in Kentucky that weren't great, and that their, or, their state organization really went to the state and advocated, so find you some buddies in your organization. That's a great point, Alice. Thank you so much. So we just have a couple of minutes, and we've got a bunch of questions. Let's just start here, and then uh, a quick well, just, question, I'm quick Sam, answer. I'm a nurse practitioner in Philadelphia. I'm carrying my Suboxone today because I'm, or I'm sorry, my Suboxone, my Narcan today because I'm too scared to travel without it because there's so much overdose all around us. Um, I did want to say um, I do think the dosing for Suboxone is very regional. Where I am in, in Philly, we usually start um, everybody at 24 milligrams, frequently find that's not strong enough, and then do the serial sublocade 300 milligrams, as in like for years. Um, so I, I do think it's very regional. The Prevention Point Philly, um, who someone mentioned over in the other time zone, um, has a micro, macro, and traditional dosing guide on their website with their excellent. Thank you. That is great. One thing I didn't bring up um, is that knowing what and how your patient use. If you have a patient population, and I think Philly is mostly injection, is it um, of the population you're seeing? Mostly injection. And if it's mostly injection of fentanyl, that is the group that you're going to need to see. I will say in Alabama, there's a fair amount of insufflation, um, which is a fancy way of saying snorting. And believe it or not, I have a lot of patients that is their primary mode of use and has been forever. Um, and, and that is a group who needs, in my experience, less. They're using less. They're needing less of, of the suboxone to treat. But yes, I think that's a great point. Question regarding the portability and the viability of the naltrexone. I live in southwest Florida where it gets quite hot inside vehicles. Can it tolerate that heat or do we have to keep it with us? Do you know? It's not, yes, I have a nurse champion who leads our naloxone um, program for our clinic and she frequently reminds our patients, do not keep it in your car, keep it in your bag, keep it in your you know, pocket, whatever, um, but, but try not to leave it in your car. It's a great question. So one of the questions was, what happens if you give naloxone to someone who doesn't need it, like that slumped patient? What if they didn't need it and you gave it to them? So it is very safe, nothing will happen to that. Now, they, they you know, maybe upset as you or angry, but you know, you have tried to save their life. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and then, there are good Samaritan laws. I was going to bring that up as well. I've heard people say, well, what if I give it and there's some bad outcome? There are good Samaritan laws that protect you if you try to save a bystander's life. Okay. And if someone's in a methadone clinic, do you feel strongly about bringing them into a buprenorphine program? And if you do, how do you make that transition? Is that something you can cover maybe in your talk today? In, in, in my, in Alabama, because we're, um, you know, rural, a lot of patients come to me asking for buprenorphine because they're not able to make the frequent treks to methadone clinics, which may initially be daily. Um, it's transportation, it's time away from work, it's getting there at 6 a.m. So I do have patients um, coming to me to transition. That is not, um, th that requires a little bit more education, that transitioning from methadone to buprenorphine because methadone is long acting and takes days to get out of your systems before you hit that withdrawal that we talked about on the Cal store. So that is a situation where you'll want to reach out to your addiction medicine or addiction psychiatry colleagues. It can be an E, um, I often do a portal chat with my colleagues. Hey, John Smith's coming in, here's what he's taking, and they will talk me through what their recommendation is. Um, so yeah, it is more complicated if they're transitioning from methadone to buprenorphine. And, and something I'm just gonna ask you, uh, in Baltimore, I think they're doing more training now about not that so much xylazine around that if you give Narcan, you're not gonna see that 
response you expect to see. So people are supposed to start breathing. That's the response you're looking for, and not necessarily waking up like they do on television. And just remember that if there's a lot of xylazine in your Yes, in your yes. And xylazine, interestingly, we don't, there's some recent reports that it is a kappa opioid um, antagonist. We, we, don't, we don't actually know how it works. So, but, but yes, it is thought that naloxone will not re reverse xylazine, certainly not completely, and that patient's going to need additional support for resuscitation, yeah. Right, so you don't need to give them 15 doses of naloxone. They're, if they're breathing, they're breathing, if and that breathing, was what you were breathing. trying to accomplish That's until right. the, the EMS yeah. got there. Okay, thank you very thank much, you. everyone. Really appreciate it.